Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to session 39 of 47. Man, there have been some amazing sessions, powerful stories, just a lot of it coming out here for a Dare to Be Great 3. And it's going by so fast. It's crazy. And all I see in the comments lately in the past <laughs> few ses uh, sessions is hashtag DTBG4. <laughs> Oh man, it, it's really cool to see. That's 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 really awesome. That you know, there's just this whole experience has been amazing. And um, Joe and I were in the green room just a moment ago, and we were just we were just talking and laughing. And uh, it was actually playing some um, <laughs> some Jackson Five as he was coming in. I'm just getting down and everything, getting ready for the session and stuff, because that's usually what happens in the green room. If you've been in the green room with me, we're usually listening to music or something or just joking around right before we get started. So I'm excited for this session. Thank you so, so much, my friend, for being here and for being uh, a speaker for DTBG3. This is Joe McCarville, if you don't know him, and he's the owner of 9 Gold Line Training. His session is We Are All 9 right? Thank you for being yeah. here, man. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having us on and welcome everybody to the last session of the day for Dare to be Great 3. It's a true honor uh, to be speaking in the third Dare to be Great conference. And thanks to all the 1,166 listeners that are tuned in right now. I put a message up at the beginning that said we're going to do something very special at the end. And I think it'll be impactful. So if you'll just stay tuned for the last hour today, I think everybody will uh, assist in that and make it really, really special. Uh, so the first couple minutes of today's presentation, I wanted to share a few uh, major events that I went through uh, as a manager in two different events. I want to share light on the fact that these events are both tragic and I don't want to cause anybody more stress, but I wanted to share these because it ties into the material for the rest of the class. So I wanted to acknowledge that right up front. Uh, so the first event that I want to talk about uh, happened in the county to our south at the time, the county that backs us up as an agency uh, when I worked there. And what happened was on January 6th, 2006, somebody had killed his girlfriend, a four-year-old child, the dog, and then called 911 uh, prior to killing himself. Such a tragic event. And the suspect ended up working at the jailer at that agency. It was a small county at the time and I was at home and our sheriff called me on the phone and said, hey, Joe, uh, this event took place. We need you to get down there. It wasn't our agency, but it was the agency we used to back us up and said, you need to get down there and find out what kind of assistance they need for staffing their agency so that they can go to critical incident debriefing training in case they need to go to any funerals or wakes uh, to seek closure or get some assistance and you need to find out how our agency can help them out and staff them. Uh, since we use them as our backup agency and we had plans in place, I wasn't thinking about pay or anything like that at the time. I just knew I got a direct order from our sheriff and we needed to go down there and take care of another agency in need. So I responded to that agency. I met with them, spoke with them, asked them what it is that they need. I learned their system. Now, they were a very small county, typically had one to two deputies on at a time. And so it was kind of easier to keep up with the workflow rather than going into a much larger agency. Uh, when I arrived, I made it all about their agency and what they needed, asked them questions and how we could help. How we could help was by staffing their agency so that they could get the assistance that they needed. And I spoke with our dispatchers and said, who would be willing to go down there and help them? We got both of our departments covered and we only had 12 dispatchers at the time and we did it on three different days. Now, what I did from a payroll purpose as the managers, I submitted as training hours since they're our backup 911 center. And unfortunately or fortunately, uh, payroll uh, was denied. So our dispatchers were not paid uh, for going down there and assisting them. As a manager, I felt like a little bit of a, a failure uh, but one thing I realized about 911 dispatchers is that when an event like this takes place, they will be, there will be more volunteers than you can possibly ask for. And 911 dispatchers, all of you listening today are extremely awesome, and so was that staff. But what goes around does come around. And what happened was the 911 manager at this agency uh, recommended us for Iowa APCO Team of the Year. And by a, uh, a board, uh, for Iowa APCO, our dispatchers were selected as team of the year 
uh, for assisting that agency in need. The only thing that we received locally from it was I had to create a certificate. This is similar to what it looked like. Again, this was several years ago uh, and I had never really made a certificate before, uh, but the board members on our commission uh, the president and the vice president did take care of signing this, and that's what I was able to give to our dispatchers. The interesting thing is I never heard a single dispatcher complain and go down about going down there and assisting them and not being paid. For some, this profession is more than just doing the job. It's doing what it takes to be successful, and that's going to be a huge part of today's presentation. That's why I share that story. And the second one I want to share is also similar in nature. Like I said, there are two tragic events. And this was a double murder and kidnapping of two young girls. On July 13th, 2012, the two girls went missing. And on December 5th, their bodies were found 25 miles where they were last seen. What happened was this agency was a larger agency for the state of Iowa. And they were still working several hours of overtime trying to keep up with all of the phone calls. Uh, they involved the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, they involved the FBI. Uh, they put up a tip line for people to call in and speak with dispatchers. And the tip line was actually at the smaller police department in that county where the event took place. Uh, the 911 manager of that agency put out a call for help. And I instantly responded. And I knew from previously I wasn't concerned about pay. I wanted to help them do whatever I could uh, to do that. And there I am sitting in their agency where I was taking calls for the F FBI and turning them in. And the interesting thing was they didn't have any volunteers for a Saturday morning shift. And they said, would you be willing to come up and open up the police department, reroute the tip line back to the phone and take some calls for us? And of course, I said, absolutely, I would do that. And I went in there. I called the dispatch center, rerouted the phones as they trained me to do. And I had used the CAD system that that agency used at a previous job. And the very first call I took on the tip line was actually a domestic, not about the actual double ki uh, kidnapping and double murder, but it was a domestic. And I processed that call and put it into their CAD system for them. And I used the word C-O-M-P. And I know I'm probably going to be in the minority here. And this is where you can comment on what you use. And COMP is what our agency uses for the complainant or the person calling uh, the call for service into uh, the 911 center. I found out that several other agencies use RP uh, for reporting party. So if you use RP or complainant and you want to put it up or if you use something else, uh, feel free to go ahead and put that into the comments. I know I'm in the minority here. Uh, so that was interesting for me to receive that kind of feedback and learn something there. Hey, thanks, Aaron, for complaining. We're on the same page there. And Roxy, she uses RP. Uh, so we're a little bit different, but at least I know uh, what they are. And Allison, 1017, I'm going to think I'm going to learn quite a bit. Uh, so the main thing with these two events is to know that they are major events that took place. So in 2020, we really faced some major events as 911 dispatchers. We faced COVID, we faced civil unrest. There were the wildland fires that took place over the fall of 2020. And it really is time to think outside of our box. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we train inside our own walls and we train our dispatchers. And we have these backup agencies that are supposed to support us if we had to evacuate or go somewhere else. But when was the last time you went somewhere and trained with somebody else? And one thing 2020 showed us is these events are going to come up and they could come rapidly and quickly. And then we also have to look at employee safety and things that we did during COVID to protect our employees, uh, protecting our agencies, making sure we're still answering the phone calls and training ourselves because these events have all similar things in nature. They turn into a crisis and you have to learn how to manage that crisis. And we're challenged in ways that we've never been challenged before. And when you look at it and you say, what are some things a leader, and a leader can be anybody. It can be a frontline dispatcher, a CTO, a supervisor, manager, or director. But a few quotes that I wanna show you from one of my mentors, Mr. John Maxwell, says a leader is supposed to show up in a crisis but often the crisis shows the leader up. And the way that we prevent things happening like that is we train for these things, we prepare, 
We start to learn about our equipment. Sometimes we train on the CAD going down, but maybe we've never trained on the radio going down. If your radio were to go down, what is your backup radio and how do you access it? And just learning more about the job than we do on a day-to-day -day basis. On an everyday basis, how we view things is how we do things. So if you come to work negatively and you have a bad attitude or maybe the phone's ringing and you have some callers on the phone that are frustrating you, if you view them as annoying and that they're hindering you from doing a good job, you're going to treat them poorly and have bad customer service. The choices you make every day at work will definitely make you, but how you respond to a crisis will reveal you. There is nothing more better than that quote. That quote basically says, am I prepared and do I know how to use everything in my comm center? If something happens here, such as a tornado, a derecho, which happened in Iowa, a hurricane, a wildland fire, um, shots fired, an officer going down, a firefighter being trapped inside a building, what training do you have to help you get through that? And the more you train on that now will help you because your level of training will show up during a crisis. And that goes out to the dispatchers that are doing the job, the managers that are leading teams, the CTOs that are trying to keep people staffed at your agency. Everybody is a part of that last quote. The choices you make every day at work will make you, but how you respond to a crisis will reveal you. Let a crisis reveal you to show that you are trained and ready for absolutely everything. How do you lead during a crisis? The first thing and foremost thing to understand is it is all about the people, putting your people first, especially if you are the manager, director, or leader. Their safety has to be priority number one. We saw that during COVID. Agencies that lost people or went down to 50% staffing or what it was and how we got through that. We need to educate ourselves and make sure we know what we're doing. And here's an interesting one, be flexible. Sometimes uh, flexibility and or change is not something that is always appreciated or could be a little bit frowned upon, but let's get better at dealing with these change. And for managers out there, leverage the people you work with during a crisis, them, or during a crisis, sorry about that. Ask for different perspectives, what they bring to the table during their training and expertise. And we have to remember, they're the ones that are doing the job. Even if you got hired from inside and you used to dispatch and maybe you'll still fill in just once in a while, they are still doing it every day and their opinion needs to be heard, especially during a crisis. Be authentic. Understand during a crisis, you will not have the answers to everything. Admitting to them, I don't know, is okay. Even during a non-crisis, that's okay. Uh, do the right thing, encourage others, and most importantly, understand for everybody, the hardest person to lead is always yourself. So make sure on a day-to-day -day basis you're leading yourself because that will carry over uh, during a crisis and during a major event. And also, think big picture. All right, Always think big picture. And how do we think big picture in dispatch? Maybe you've been trained on thinking about way, things this way, and maybe you haven't embrace the, the challenge that we're facing. Do not strive for certainty. You must get used to dealing with change and embracing it. Learn from these things. Learn from each crisis. Learn every day. Don't rest on your success. Try to learn and grow every single day. There's new products that are coming out that are changing the landscape of 911. A few of them here are listed. Rapid SOS is a free product to 911 centers that assists with accuracy for 911 callers. If you haven't received that product or are not utilizing that product, you can still take the time to learn about it. Even if you're a frontline employee, maybe you can be the person that educates your manager or supervisor into why we need that. And if you've never heard of the program, What Three Words?, Think about if a caller calls you and just rattles off three random words. As I look at my desk right now, I have headphones on it, a clock and a stapler. Maybe that's all they say when you take that 911 phone call is headphone, stapler and clock. And you're thinking, what is going on? They're using three completely random words. What they just gave you is a precise and accurate location to a problem where maybe they cannot talk. So to see the big picture, embrace things, learn every single day. Even if you're not using a product that's out there, you can still take the time to educate yourself and learn about it. 
and start to gain insight from a variety of people. There's people that work in large centers. There's people that work in small centers. There's people that dispatch volunteers. Sometimes that's all people rely on is volunteers for all medical calls in their jurisdiction. There's solo PSAPs where they work alone versus people that are only call takers or maybe only dispatchers after being promoted. Everybody has a unique story. We are all 911 and we can all learn from each other no matter the size of our agency, the job that we do, what resources we have available, continue to grow each and every single day. So I'm gonna try something virtually. There's 1,166 people listening. And when I say these things, can we learn together? I wanna see if we can. So let's see if I can improve everybody's performance virtually over a computer. We're gonna try a challenge. Now I have done this challenge in the state of Wisconsin and Tennessee. So if you've seen this before, don't comment too fast because uh, most people probably have not seen this. It's a one minute exercise and I know I'm ahead of the playback, but that's okay. So I'm getting my stopwatch ready. And when I hit to the next slide, you're going to have one minute to look at this piece of paper that shows up on the slide. I want you to look for the number one. Once you find the number one, you're gonna look for the number two and then go in chronological order for one minute and see how many numbers you can find. After that minute is up, I'm gonna train everybody on the policy of the piece of paper. We'll redo it and see if we can get our performance to improve virtually. Sometimes hands-on learning is the best way to remember, remember information and I'm gonna try it for the first time virtually. So here we go, one minute, as soon as I hit to the next slide and go. And I'm gonna be the annoying coworker that's on the phone next to you and kind of talk through this whole thing as you're trying to find, because we're always distracted as 911 dispatchers. So you're looking for the numbers in order and you're at 15 seconds. You've got 45 more seconds to go, all right? You're at 20 seconds, still looking for those numbers in order to see how far you can go. Here we go, we're almost to the halfway point and 30 seconds. I'm gonna be quiet, now the callers have dropped off. All right, still looking for those numbers. You are now three quarters of the way done. And you have 10 seconds to keep going and finding as many numbers as you can. And we will see where we got to. You are now done. All right, that was one minute. If you wanna go ahead and put some comments in the uh, section of how many numbers you found, that'll help to see if we improve. And I'm looking and uh, go ahead and comment even if you only found five, that's okay. Thanks, Jill. Jill's at 17. Uh, that's awesome. And go ahead and comment no matter what you got, because we're gonna see if we can improve everybody's performance when we redo this. I'm gonna now teach you the policy of this piece of paper and we're gonna try it one more time. So when you're looking at this piece of paper, we're gonna say it's a new program or something you've never used, but maybe it's something at work that you currently have in place that you should be able to utilize. You were trained on it years ago and you just never used it. Well, let's see how performance can improve if we keep going. If you actually split this piece of paper into four quadrants, you're gonna notice that the number one is in the top left quadrant. The number two is in the top right quadrant. The number three, the bottom right, four, bottom left, five, top right, six, bottom right, and so on, and it keeps going. We're going to do this for one more minute, and I'm going to have you start, and we're gonna see if the performance will improve. So go ahead and start now. And just like the last time, uh, we're going to see how much better we can do. And I'm going to be the phone or the keyboards that you hear typing, distracting you the whole way through the minute. So it's an equal comparison. And you're 15 seconds in, seeing how many numbers you can find. You are now at the uh, halfway point on the redo. All right, you're getting close now. You have 15 seconds to go. 
10 seconds left. Five seconds to go. And on the second time, go ahead and stop. And then once again, I want you to put your new number in the comments and just put an asterisk by it or something or just write improved or thumbs up if you improve so we can see if the performance has really helped. I apologize, Todd. Hip, that you can't see all of them. I do apologize to you and Gerald as well. And for those of you that improved, that was great. Uh, they were on the screen, and uh, I do apologize for those of you that can't see them, but a lot of comments are coming in, and people were able to improve. And I appreciate those that worked through that and just went on to the next number. So thanks for pointing that out as well. Uh, the results since we did this virtually is that when employees are trained on something, the performance automatically improves. Uh, it, awareness is huge. Training on something is great. Uh, when employees understand the policy, the performance improves. So when I first put it up there, nobody really understood the trick to doing it. Uh, the numbers were a little bit lower. When we trained on the piece of paper and understood how we could do it more effectively, performance went up. Lastly, I let you guys practice on it virtually because when people do something, they tend to remember it a lot more often. And lastly, which I can't do because I'm the only one speaking, in order to retain retention, or retain information, the best way, especially when training a new dispatcher is to show them how to do it, let them do it, and then have them show you how they do it back and let them teach you. Because if you can teach something and show somebody else how to do it, your rate of retention dramatically improves. And I think if I brought any of the ones on that show that they improved and commented, that they would be able to teach that piece of paper back to somebody. So remember when teaching somebody else or implementing a new procedure or a policy, the best way to do it is to make sure they show it back to you uh, for retention purposes. So how is it that we keep training fun? I talked about at the beginning of the day, all of these traumatic events uh, that we go through as 911 dispatchers and things that we have to overcome, and whether it's resiliency or post-traumatic stress or, stress or critical incident debriefings, we deal with some very traumatic things. And so when we get the opportunity to do some hands-on learning, and maybe you don't have the overtime budget for that, but these are a few of the examples I'm going to show. And this picture up there um, of the people holding the fire extinguisher and the fire behind them, that's actually at our agency. Our city was challenged to train all employees uh, with fire extinguisher, extinguisher usage. And they sent out this video and I asked, do we have to watch the video? Because I just didn't feel like there'd be a lot of retention, but they said, yes, but you could also improve upon it and do something that you wanted to do yourself. And so what I did is I reached out to our fire department and they said that they do have training that they do for fire extinguishers as long as we would come over and participate in it. So they got to actually use the fire extinguisher. That fire behind her, they actually had a little box out there and they would light it on fire. And then each dispatcher got to come out and put the liquid out and figure out how to use the extinguisher in case there was ever an emergency. I can promise you that they had more fun doing that training than just watching the video. And they're probably more effective at us using the fire extinguisher if we ever have a fire at our building. Another thing that I did is we did dispatcher feud instead of family feud. So I broke them up into teams during an in-service training day. And I said the top five answers are on the board. And I just built it out of an Excel spreadsheet. And then I filled in the cells and then unhit them when they got the answers correct. And they had a ton of fun and we actually reviewed policies. And one of the things I did is I focused on morale at this point. I said, name five things that are causing our agency stress. And they were naming them. We were going through some implementation of new programs. And what I did is I got information from them that these are the things that are holding us back as an agency in a very lighthearted, honest uh, way where they felt comfortable sharing their information. Now, an interesting one is they got four out of the five right uh, that I had on the list, and they had two strikes. For those that watch Family Feud, you get three strikes. And the, the answer that one of the employees gave was the new operations manager. <laughs> and I had to laugh uh, because that was me. And so I did not put that in there. Maybe I should have. 
So I gave it the big red X and uh, we talked about those things. And what I got to say was, look, if I'm ever causing you guys stress, uh, please let me know. But we, in essence, from playing a 30 minute game across several different days to make sure all of our dispatchers went through it, we're able to find ways to review several policies. We also have to do something for the fire department when paging out things. And I said, what four things need to be included when paging out the fire department? Because we were always missing one of those four things as it was a new change. We, we haven't missed one since the family feud training because everybody went through that together. It was really a great example of a way to have fun at work, build team com camaraderie, and also let people share ideas in an open and honest way where they didn't feel there would be any repercussions or any negativity from it. I also taught a customer service by using building blocks. And I just bought some kids blocks and I put together the structure. And then I put the same number of blocks in two different bags and add four people total. So two different teams. Uh, one person had to keep their eyes closed and one person had to give directions to them. The blocks were colors, so there was yellow, green, blue, all the colors you can imagine. And the person with their eyes closed had to build the same structure uh, that was in front of them, listening to the person giving the instructions. And so this is always a fun one to watch. And they instantly start laughing and they have fun. And I've done this at other trainings, at, trainings as well. And the participants really enjoy doing this. And I tell them it's a race because I want to put a little stress on them. And how I relate that to customer service is when we get done, I always tell them when you said, you know, you accidentally slipped, they got their eyes closed or they're blindfolded or whatever. And you told them as the person giving them instructions, grab the blue block. And then you guys started to laugh about it and you realized, oh, wait, they can't see. And you had to change your method to get them to still grab the right thing. Well, what that did, and I related it to us taking calls, is sometimes we'll say, what direction are you going? And they'll, they don't know north, south, east, west. They don't know what road they're on. And rather than us getting frustrated and getting attitude in our voice, we need to rephrase the question that we're asking by looking for landscape or landmarks or whatever it might be, or a house that they just passed with a number or a business they just passed or different ways or utilizing or implementing new resources so we can quicker and more accurately find people. So I related the building blocks exercise to them finding different ways to communicate with their coworker as if they were a caller. And the customer service building blocks is fun. They get to have a, a ton of uh, great time do, doing it. Uh, they laugh a lot, especially when somebody you know says, grab the one right in front of you and there's four different ones in front of them they're feeling around or grab the different colored one or whatever it might be. And they really have a great time doing these trainings. The other thing I wanna challenge you on is to get involved. And what I mean by that is 911 is changing dramatically. And there's different ways you can get involved. A lot of times I hear we're a solo piece app and we can't go to that. There's magazine articles. You can now get them online do training days, this Dare to be Great 3, Dare to be Great 2, all you had to do, Be the Difference Conference, is register. That's it, and you can go back and watch them. Become a member of APCO or NINA if you can afford to do so. Sometimes maybe you can't, or maybe your agency will or will not pay for it. Uh, Ride-alongs, a lot of this stuff you've heard before. Uh, one of the things once COVID goes away, we're looking into is a dispatcher exchange program where one of the agencies that we back up comes up and works with our dispatcher for the day and we go down there. I am going to make sure, go back to the first slide, that it's covered by training hours before we implement that at our center just to be safe. Uh, the other one is contests in a dispatch center. Uh, the dispatchers love doing that, whether it be a shift contest, you know, do a, anything to raise awareness for something they're passionate about in the community. Get them involved. Uh, they want to be more involved than just doing the job. They want to have a part in their department nowadays. And learn about new technology. I talked about Rapid SOS uh, previously and how you can read about it, but there's webinars, there's things you can watch, even if you don't uh, have the product implemented at your agency. Rapid Deploy and cloud-based uh, CAD systems and how that would have helped during civil unrest and during a time of the wildland fires if you had to evacuate. It's no longer one more thing that dispatch has to do. Every dispatcher needs to know it's one more life we can save or help or make a difference. 
911 is truly changing. The job is different than what it's ever been before. And the more you can learn about these products, the more you can educate yourself when they do get implemented at your agency, you'll understand them and know what's possible and the difference that you can make. All too often when you hear change at a 911 center, you hear, oh, that's just one more thing we have to do. That's just one more thing we have to do. And if you start looking at those things as it's one more thing where we could possibly save a life, your attitude will change towards those new products. Your attitude is the single most thing and the single most important factor that will determine your success in any job that you have. If you have a negative attitude, it's not going to help. Have a positive attitude and realize we make a difference in the lives of people every single day that we go to work because it's time we start to shift. And what I mean by shifting is it's one of the shifts that I'm challenging everybody to make and it's called leader shift is the personal development shift. Improving yourself is the first step to improving everything else around you. And the ways that we do that is we embrace change. Start to understand that the changes that we are facing in 911 are something that is positive. We're now getting more data thrown at us than we've ever had, but we're getting it thrown at us in ways that we can quickly look at and utilize. There's organizations that are partnering up to make us more efficient and effective at our jobs and also more timely, whether it be with an NFPA or whether it be with anything else that you use, whether it be EMD, emergency medical dispatch, or emergency fire police, or the National Fire Protection Association. How do those data-driven points and analytics all pull together so that we can make more effective decisions at the job and empower our dispatchers to be effective at the tools that they have to make the best decisions possible. We're able to get people quicker to the right location more often than we've ever been able to in the past. Make your love of learning growing better than your fear of failing. Uh, we don't want to fail in 911. 911 lives are on the line. We understand that, but we also can't be afraid to do our job. And we can do our job more effectively and more efficiently when we continue to grow and learn, test things, do things, enter, re-enter, fail, learn from them, but don't fail on purpose. And hopefully you only fail in training. But we're going to make mistakes once in a while. And how we prevent those is to make sure we're growing and learning every single day. Another one is to believe in yourself. You guys can do this. You absolutely can. Every single one of you, whether your department is low staff, low morale, high turnover, uh, terrible equipment, whatever problem is facing you, you can still make yourself better every single day. As long as you are excited to improve yourself first, rather than a coworker, your agency or your surroundings, anything is possible. If you come into work and you say, if only Joe wouldn't be here, he's such a negative person today. Joe may be a negative person every single day, but it shouldn't have any impact, even though it's hard not to, it shouldn't have any impact on the job that you are doing to learn, grow, and succeed. A positive culture takes a lot of effort, but it will continue to become contagious the more people that start to do it, and eventually that negativity will start to dwindle and positive will win out but you have to be the catalyst at your agency. It has to start somewhere and it can start with you. A second shift that I challenge everybody to make is the passion shift. Some wake up to an alarm, others wake up to a calling. Uh, the passion shift, there's a big difference between a career and a calling. And for the majority of the people watching on here, the 1,168 people that are watching, a career is about you, and for some, that's okay, but a calling is about others. The law enforcement agencies that we serve, the fire people that we serve and protect, the medical people, the animal control people, the DNRs, the airport police, whatever you work with at your agency, it is about them, and you get to make a difference in their lives by helping protect them. There's no better feeling than helping protect the people we dispatch for so that they are able to protect the citizens that we are also serving. A career is something you choose. A calling is something that chooses you. And I can speak to this, okay? I left the 911 profession for a few years because I wanted to move back closer to home because there was a series of cancer illnesses in my family over the span of about three years 
where I had six or seven different people battling cancer all at the same time over those course of those years. And I wanted to come back home. So I left 911 and I went to a phone cable and internet company that taught me a ton about data analysis and data input and how do you massage and manipulate that and turn it into reports and make informed decisions. And it also taught me about technology. It made me a better 911 manager, but I missed 911 because 911 is truly my calling. It's what I love. I think all of you do as well. So I think it is your calling as well. A calling is something, a career is something you can take or leave, but a calling never leaves you. There are calls and there are things that are going to stick with every single person that's listening right now. Those two examples at the beginning of the presentation that I gave for me, they stick with me. And they didn't happen at the agency I work at. I also have the calls that stuck with me from when I was dispatching or from the agency I'm currently working at now where I'm a manager where we've made changes because we didn't make the best decisions during the critical incident debriefing. We're all going to have those calls that really stick with us. And that's part of having a job that is also a calling. In a career, you're measured by success, but a calling you're measured by significance. In 911, all of us have the job where we can be significant. We can make a difference in somebody's lives. We can stay on the phone when maybe we don't have all of the information to make sure we get them help. We can continue asking questions when somebody doesn't know where they're at. We can ask uh, questions to protect a caller that's trapped in a situation where they're unable to speak by asking them to tap on the phone or doing other things. Our text to 911 is now available. There are things that are happening in 911 where all of us can truly be significant in the job that we have. To me, we have one of the best jobs to make a difference in people's lives, and we need to recognize that we have an amazing job. We also have to recognize that the staff is being burdened with the stress from these calls, find ways to make them resilient, make sure they're involved in critical incident debriefings, and make sure they get the help that they need. We can make a difference inside our walls, but we have a truly awesome job where we can make a difference outside our walls and be significant in our professional careers. And to me, there is nothing better than that. But things that'll help you with a great career, all right? And I put these up because they're interesting to read. They kind of almost have a little bit of a negative connotation to them that there's times where disappointments are gonna be greater than we expected. We all know that. Maybe you work in a smaller community where you take a call from a loved one or a family member and that low could never get any lower when it's somebody that you personally know and you truly love them. All right, but with price that we're going to pay when it's mandatory overtime, we got schedules where you're gonna miss birthdays, vacations, holidays, getting forced over when you had plans to go home because somebody called in sick. Doesn't mean it's not a great career. Understand what you can and cannot do at your agency. The things that you cannot change should not cause you stress. Hopefully you can look at them and maybe make an argument to make the change if it's truly necessary, but don't let it burden you down so much if it's not possible. And the interesting thing is that people who achieve success or significance love what they do and they do it well. One thing about 911 dispatchers that what I've met all across the nation is every single one of us love what we do. Sometimes there's things in our environment where maybe we say if it wasn't for, and you can fill in the blank, whether it be the equipment, maybe a coworker, maybe a boss, uh, whatever it would be, I love my job. Find ways to fix those things because we shouldn't let that burden us and work hard every single day work hard because we are first responders. Some of you listening right now, depending on what state you're uh, watching from, are a first responder already. But in my mind, all of you are. All of you are first responders. And I just want to share a little bit about becoming a first responder uh, because we went through the process in Iowa. And I ask, you know, are your dispatchers in your state classified as first responders? Uh, the map that I could find when I did some research on this, and I want to give the proper shout out. So thank you to James. Uh, this was a map that he shared, and I used it in this presentation because the green states, when I took this and put it together, were classified as first responders. If your state is a first responder and you're not in green, go ahead and feel free to comment in the comments so we can give you the proper recognition. And then the other colors are there. The county approved is purple 
bills and legislator are blue and PTSD legislation is uh, yellow. And so the green states are what I want to focus on. And you can see there's California, Texas, Kansas, West Virginia, Indiana, and my home state of Iowa. And I want to give a few tips of how Iowa became first responders so that everybody here can get involved. Because like I said, the title of the class is we are all 911. Uh, understanding that it was a joint effort that was led by Iowa APCO and Iowa NINA. We had to educate the members of our organization. We had to obtain representation at the state level. And one thing I want to caution everybody on is to make sure you have your agency's permission if you're speaking on behalf of your agency. Uh, there's nothing more important in doing this, especially when we're interacting with legislators. We want to make sure we have the proper approval to be speaking. It doesn't mean you can't speak to them if you don't have approval. You're just speaking as a citizen of where you live and as a public person rather than an employee of. Uh, the education of the legislators is huge. I know when I went to my first breakfast in the county that I live in and I met some of the legislators that represent the area where I live, and they said, well, all you do is answer the phone and talk on the radio, right? How, I mean, how come you're a first responder? Don't be disappointed in their questions. If they're asking questions, it means they're trying to learn. Was that question kind of talking down to the job that 911 dispatchers do? In my mind, absolutely. But if I would have got upset by that question and answered it with a certain tone in my voice, the answer wouldn't have resonated with them. And I'm proud to say that when it ended up passing Iowa, it did so basically unanimously. We did our job, it took several years, and what I say by disappointed is don't think it's going to happen overnight. It may take a little bit of time to get this approved. And I know as IOAPCO president from 2015 to 18, I was disappointed that we didn't get it done during that time. Now, I'm proud to say that the president that came in and took over for me for, and also came into Iowa Nina did a fantastic job and kept the ball rolling. And as of July 1st, 2020 911 dispatchers in the state of Iowa are now recognized as first responders. So I'm really proud of the effort that we made. Uh, some other advice for uh, pursuing the first responder status is to find out who you let who you <laughs> who your legislators are. Sorry about that. Uh, where do you go to find that information? And asking somebody who can I contact. I recommend one common voice for 911 in your area if possible. And the reason I say if possible is there are states that have really large cities and maybe some very small cities. And how do you all get that one voice and consistent message? Read the whole bill. I cannot stress that enough. Whenever you are looking or working for an organization or invested in trying to improve the laws in your state, make sure you read the whole bill. Sometimes they'll put things in there. We'll make you first responders. And we also recognize that everyone needs to be or something along those lines. So you want to make sure you understand it just before reading the parts that you may or may not like. Um, ask questions. Ask a lot of questions to ensure you understand it. Think long term uh, and always work together with everybody so that there's a common voice for 911 in your area. Because I want to see as many states turning green that can turn green as possible, which means you're recognized as first responders because that's what you are. So the question that I'm gonna end the presentation with here coming up is how did 911 get a voice? How did we all come together across the nation? And I came up with the class title, we are all 911, right? But there's a hashtag that started it all. And Ricardo, if you'll come back on screen with that hat on backwards, my man, I'd appreciate it. So while we're waiting for Ricardo to jump back in here, uh, I want to say that the hashtag that started it all is hashtag I am 911. That hashtag, Ricardo, has given all of us a voice. And why I close this out, I want to have Ricardo see the difference he's making across the nation. And so if you'll put hashtag I am 911 in the comments and then the state that you um, are from, and I'm going to go ahead and start it off since I'm probably ahead of most people um, like that. So he can see the difference that he's making as we close out day three for the 
Dare to be great conference. I want to thank you, Ricardo, for giving me a voice, giving everybody here a voice that's listening, giving the nation a voice, making us first responders, and daring us all to be great because these three conferences have been phenomenal. And you, my man, deserve a lot of credit, just like all the dispatchers doing the job and attending today, because these conferences wouldn't be possible without the dispatchers doing the job, without the vendors supporting us, and without you daring yourself and all of us to be great. So I wanted to end the presentation with a huge thank you to you and just say, hashtag Ricardo, I am 911. And that's the license plate that hangs in my office because of you, my man. Wow. <clears throat> thank you, man. That I, I, I appreciate it. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it more uh, than you know. And actually, you know, I have one of those license plates as well. I have it on my on my wall back here by my uh, my printing equipment. I was wondering why, you know, you had sent me a message like, I want you to, to make sure you're wearing your hat. I was like, okay. <laughs> is, my hair, is my hair messed up or what? <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. I I appreciate it. It has been um, it has been an amazing experience, man. And uh, you know, knowing you and just everyone, uh, you know, being a part of uh, what everyone is doing in nine one one and and sharing those stories. You know, all of this started back in twenty ten as uh, as a college project, and it has it has been amazing. Thank you for yeah, you're welcome for the shout out. That's whew, you got me in yeah. the feels, dude. <laughs> I just remember when we were in Tennessee and um, we sat down and we were both at the same conference and we uh, spoke and uh, just said, what can we do to bring more people together? And I knew you were going to make it happen. And I knew <laughs> that uh, something was going to happen. And uh, you challenged all of us to dare to be great. And I can't wait what's next to become, but I think hashtag DTBG4 is trending, so no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that was uh, that was an, an excellent conference. We were there, and, uh, you know, I think actually that was – it was one of the first times I got to see you uh, speak. I was in there with my with my camera, and I was taking some pictures and stuff. And the room was uh, was packed, and it was really it was standing room only. And just watching you do your thing, and seeing everyone get into it, I just thought, hell yes! Like this is <laughs> this is what it's all about, man. Uh, and and those who are watching right now, if you have not had a chance to, um, you know, attend a session, whether it be like this virtually or uh, in person, Joe is the man. Like, it is really good, dude. Your your inner your energy, the uh, just the way you you know deliver you know stories and everything. Just it is amazing. So check out everything that Joe is doing with uh, Nine One Gold Line training. And thank you. Just looking into the comments right here, seeing everything pop up. That's uh, Oof. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us, awesome. man. And I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, day four and you guys closing out the conference. This has been a special thing to be involved in all three. And I thank everybody for watching and the vendors that supported it. And uh, thanks to you as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, for sure. How, how can people get a hold of you and, and find out more about you and everything that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. My email is joe at 911goldlinetraining.com. You can also go to 911goldlinetraining.com on uh, the website and 91 Gold Line Training for Facebook and Instagram and then 91 Gold Line TRG for Twitter. And I also want to throw out, you can also watch us speak on We Speak Dispatch, the podcast. I'm frequently involved in those as well. And make sure you go like We Speak Dispatch and you can hear some other speakers uh, talk as well about topics all relating to 911. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun on the couple episodes that uh, I was on with you and the crew. And, uh, you know, definitely those who are watching right now, make sure to check them out because there was there was something awesome about it. And there, it's it's there's a question that ends up going out to everyone that nobody knows about. And <laughs> you're you're literally put on the spot. And I'm pretty sure one of them started they're like, Ricardo, you guys are like, Ricardo, we'll start with you. It's like, oh, shit. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're, they're uh, you know, relevant questions to the topics that we're going to be talking about. And, and they're also, um, you know, micro, right? There's like 15, 20 minutes mm -hmm. worth of uh, episode. And there's so much uh, information that's packed in there. So it was yeah. a lot of fun. And uh, 
everybody make sure to check it out. I do want to mention something really quick here before uh, before we go, and let me make sure I, I click it on here. Um, but I, I just wanted to wait till the very end of the session to put that in there. So every day we've been doing a giveaway. So Vicky Hernandez, uh, you are the uh, winner of a $100 Amazon gift card. So make sure to uh, send me an email to claim your prize, and uh, we'll get it going there. But, um, you know, a- another thing I want to say before we close out is when we when we were talking about um, you know the conferences and everything, and when uh, when I called you up uh, to ask you if you could be if you wanted to be a, a keynote speaker, um, <laughs> there was there <laughs> there was bacon right there was like, there was a bacon incident. <laughs> yes, there was. I was cooking breakfast at the time, and you kind of caught me off guard. And um, yeah, I, they, I, the smoke alarms ended up going off, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> so. It was interesting because I paused and I forgot I was cooking the bacon and I kind of overdid it. I was I was very honored and shocked and it caught me so off guard that I uh, forgot what I was doing. I even forgot to answer your question. So you were like, oh, he doesn't want to do it or what's going on? And there was all sorts of things going on is what the problem it was. It was it was hilarious because I, we ended up having a phone conversation. Um, but I don't remember. I thought you maybe you were busy or something or i thought you were busy that's why i was texting you first yeah and then you sent me a picture of the the burnt bacon you're like this is what happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, i didn't answer you right away yeah so mm-hmm. it was it was amazing but you know thank you as always man for being um a supporter of of all of this and, and being involved and just everything that you do for uh dispatch as well uh, between you, you know, Doug, Leslie, Jill, um, Glenna, everybody, just thank you so, so very much for for the continued support and for what it is that you do for 911. And again, make sure to check out Joe and what he does with 911 Gold Line Training. It is amazing. Tim says, save the bacon. <laughs> I see those bacon <laughs> comments. They're cracking me up. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I know, right? Save the bacon. That is so funny. That's going to be the hashtag that's going on around save there as the well. Bacon. Save the bacon. Well, we'll see you guys later. You. Yeah, thank you all very much for uh, for everything and for being here. And make sure to check us out. Um, we are going to be starting here at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be live on Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. We're going to be doing After the Greatness. It's going to be myself, Leah, as well as uh, Karen and Jameson uh, from Rapid SOS, or Diamond Sponsors. And uh, they're going to have some guests as well. So tune in for the recap show and uh we're gonna find out what's going on new uh with rapid sos so we'll see you there and then tomorrow in the morning bright and early will be our uh, keynote for the last day of dare to be grade three and it's going to be ernie stevens he's a retired police officer out of uh, san antonio pd but also the um subject matter he and uh his former partner um Joe for Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. It was a documentary that was done with HBO. It is going to be an amazing session. You do not want to miss it. And we will see you all tomorrow. Have a good one. We'll see you.